Hi, this is a second video that I'm making on English language teaching. The topic today is methods of language teaching. It is an exciting and very practical topic which will help us to become better language trainers. As you know, the teaching of English is a very important aspect of all societies in the modern times. The teaching of language is as old as human history, perhaps. Communication being a vital aspect of all human societies. Today, over 50% of the world's population is multilingual. And teaching language is of prime importance in every culture and country. There are many diverse approaches to language teaching that have emerged over the centuries. Many of these approaches were discarded down the line, while many others have stood the test of time. So today we will talk about these various methods of language teaching. Grammar schools, that is the earliest method of language teaching in the West. We know that Shakespeare, for example, went only to a grammar school. Um, uh, until the Middle Ages and early Renaissance period, the grammar schools were very common in the English speaking countries. And they originally taught Latin, through which there was religious education also happening. These days also grammar schools or their equivalents are there in the West, in the English speaking countries like England. And today it is like a secondary school. The name grammar school came because these schools up to the Renaissance period gave importance to grammar. And over time the curriculum broadened and other subjects also began to be taught. So grammar schools gave rigorous introduction to Latin grammar. Remember Nicolas Udal, the first writer of comedy in English, was a teacher in a grammar school. In grammar schools, there was rote learning, memorization, rote learning of grammar rules, study of declensions and conjugations, translation was practiced, and there was practice given in the writing of sample sentences. Now, many of the early writers in English have emerged as a result of the education of grammar schools and the nature of education of grammar schools decided the nature of English language and literature both in early periods up to the 18th century. Because of the grammar schools, there was a heavy influence of Latin on English literature. Through Latin, people came to know about Greek literature also. So grammar schools are closely related to the nature of learning, the nature of literature and religion in the medieval and renaissance periods. Earlier methods of foreign language teaching maintained this Latin legacy. This Latin legacy is similar to how Arabic or Sanskrit are also taught. Not exactly the same, but more or less similar. So today, Many of these classical, now dead languages 
are taught in the same manner and this legacy was there in foreign language teaching at the beginning. Primarily, foreign language teaching practices focused on the illustration of grammatical systems. The language of real communication was neglected. Actual talking, conversation in the target language was neglected. And colonialism has had a great impact on English language teaching, obviously. English language teaching is the result of colonialism. Colonialism was one of the reasons for the spread of English all over the world, obviously. This relates to a term called linguistic imperialism. English language is seen as a vehicle of cultural and linguistic imperialism. The idea was introduced by Robert Philipson in the book, Linguistic Imperialism, where he said, the dominance asserted and retained by the establishment and continuous reconstitution of structural and cultural inequalities between English and other languages. Listen, what does this mean? Linguistic imperialism means the dominance of languages like English asserted and retained. The, these languages assert a dominance, retain a dominance. How? By the establishment and continuous reconstitution of structural and cultural inequalities between English and other languages. English is superior because it is upper class, it is metropolitan. English is um, superior because it is easy, you know. Like that, myths are propagated. That is a part of linguistic imperialism. So imperialism of a language, that means forceful transfer. That is the ELT term, transfer. Forceful transfer, that means imposition or dominance of one language on the speakers of another language. So in this book, Robert Philipson, 1992 book it is, he argued that global teaching of English is an act of linguistic imperialism. The global teaching of English is an act of linguistic imperialism. Why English is being taught all over the world is because of this. This transfer involves power, of, of course. Power and also culture. When you learn English language, you are also getting their culture. The imposed language, that is in our case English, maintains a, a superiority, an, an intrinsic superiority. Franz Fanon has also talked about this intrinsic nature of colonialism. Intrinsic means language, the English language by nature is superior, essentially superior. It is not because we don't know English. If it is because Indians don't know English, then we can learn English. If it is because our pronunciation is bad, we can improve our pronunciation. But whatever we do, the Indians will forever be second language learners because English and the native speaker of English have some intrinsic superiority. That is the idea of linguistic imperialism. And the dominant language is attributed with virtues like it is more logical, it is more scientific, it is more beautiful, more poetic, easier to master, you know, things like that. Latin, Arabic, Chinese, all these are other examples of potentially imperialist languages. Now, the introduction of English language and literature in colonies is an imperial, is a part of an imperial ideology to maintain cultural superiority. That is the main argument of Gauri Vishwanathan in the Masks of Conquest, where there is an essay, The Beginnings of English Literary Study in British India. This is very important 
in the very contemporary discourse of English in India. In all universities these days, in many universities in, across India, English in India or 19th century studies of English in India uh, have become very, very pertinent and fashionable. And uh, I have also made a video called English in India in uh, Udemy course, which you should definitely watch as part of ELT. Because there is a lot about 19th century English teaching in India that I have mentioned there. It's very important. So, uh, Gauri Vishwanathan's Masks of Conquest is an 89 work. It is subtitled Literary Study and British Rule in India. Literary Study and British Rule in India. It's a classic work in postcolonial studies where Gauri Vishwanathan, she was a professor in English and uh, comparative literature. She has used uh, Gramsci's concept of hegemony to analyze the relationship between political and commercial interests that the British had in India. And she has shown how the establishment of English language as a discipline in India is related to these political and commercial interests of the British. How she shows how a literary text written at that time became a mirror of the ideal Englishman and it became a mask of exploitation. The term mask is because the literary text becomes a mask of exploitation that uh, hid from us the material activities of the colonizing British government. The literary text which presumed to be superior and which presumed to be a vehicle of great values, it camouflaged, it hid from us or camouflaged the material interests and activities of the British in India. Now, we are coming to, that was by way of introduction. Now we are coming to uh, the methods. I have talked about several methods here, uh, some in very great detail. Grammar translation method is the first, as you all might be familiar. It is the traditional method of teaching foreign languages, especially uh, Greek and Latin. Originally, they, this method was employed to teach Greek and Latin. Grammar translation, what does it mean? Instruction in the grammatical analysis of the target language through translation. Instruction in the grammar, grammar of the target language or the foreign language through translation of sentences from the native language to target language and from the target language to native language, vice versa also. Translation is done in the classroom and through translation, grammar is taught. So all lessons are in the target language, which is the foreign language. There is focus on everyday vocabulary everyday use of language. So what is given here, it emphasizes the teaching of second language grammar. The target language grammar is the emphasis. The principle, it is the principal technique in the, the principal technique of grammar translation method in short called GTM. The principal technique of GTM is the translation from and into the target language. Make a note of the practitioners. Johann Seedens Tucker. Karl Plotz. You see, many of these um, developments in the early times happened in Germany. German led linguistic studies. And uh, Otto Jespersen and many other important linguists. Uh, emerged from Germany. In English in India also, we have the dominance of German masters in Indology. 
So these are Germans, Johannes, Seidenstucker, Karl Plotz, H.S. Ollendorf, Johann Meidinger. What is the history of GTM? How did it develop? It was introduced in the 1500s. Became, it became a standardized method in the late 18th century only. Introduced in the early 16th century, it became a standardized method in the late 18th century. Maximilian Berlitz was a famous proponent. Berlitz was a famous proponent and because of Berlitz, it was called the Prussian method in the US because he was from Prussia, Germany. Johann Valentin Meidinger, Johann Valentin Meidinger wrote Praktisch Französisch Grammatik. It was one of the popular texts which taught grammar and it laid the foundations of the grammar translation method as a standardized method. The German grammarian Heinrich Gottfried Ollendorf, he started some language courses. Many of them were associated with schools, Berlitz also. Ollendorf's language courses were characterized by the statement of the rule. The rule of grammar is stated, followed by a vocabulary list and translation exercises. The rule is stated, a vocabulary list is given, translation exercises are done. The contemporaries of Ollendorf praised it as an active, simple and effective method. Today this method is not very common, but even today this method is used to teach the dead languages, especially for academic and intellectual purposes. You can't actually develop communication skills through GTM. But for languages like Latin, for academic and intellectual purposes, you can use GTM because uh, it does not involve daily conversations. The, even the language is impossible to be used in daily conversations. Even if you want, you can't speak Sanskrit or Latin. They are not spoken languages, easy to speak languages. So even scholars might find it difficult to speak in Sanskrit. So these languages and GTM do, do not involve daily conversations, proper pronunciation, etc. Other textbook writers also emerged at this time, like Seedon Stucker and Ahn, they adopted the same methods. In mid 19th century, Karl Plotz, it can be uh, written in English as P-L-O-T-Z or P-L-O-E-T-Z. Actually, it's, there is an umlaut there. So in the mid 19th century, Karl Plotz in Germany adapted Seedon Stucker's French textbook. Remember, Franzosisch, it is, sorry, that is Meidinger's. <laughs> Steven Stucker's textbook I didn't mention. Uh, so Steven Stucker's, Steven Stucker's French textbook was employed by Karl Plotz. And he began considering GTM as a principal method of teaching modern languages in schools. In the early 20th century, the GTM became a principal method of teaching foreign languages in classrooms. Even in the early 20th century, it was used to teach foreign languages. However, even from its beginning, the GTM has been criticized for being a direct approach. The GTM is too direct, that is the criticism. In late 19th century, it was attacked. It began to be attacked in the late 19th century as a cold and lifeless approach and was blamed for the failure in foreign language teaching also. Even though it continued to be used in the 20th century, it was blamed for uh, its cold, lifeless approach. Dotson's bilingual method and the cognitive code learning theory were influenced by it. Bilingual method, I suppose you already know, I have already talked about it. Uh, and cognitive code learning theory, these are some later theories in ELT, influenced by uh, the GTM. Okay, now, 
what are the features of this GTM. In late 19th century, it was considered a necessary preliminary to the study of literary works. For the first time in the 19th century, GTM brought it the awareness. GTM brought the awareness that literature is learned through language. A primary technique of learning literature it became. Even in periods of criticism, even when people were criticizing it, it was considered as an educationally valid mental discipline. It teaches you to think in the target language and it gives you educational and academic excellence in the use of language. Grammar is taught deductively here, giving the general rules first and then the illustrations. Many of the later theories you will see teach grammar inductively. But here grammar is taught deductively. Now what are the teaching techniques involved in GTM? You, in examinations, you may be asked short notes about this, these methods or uh, essays or even very short answers. So language is represented, sorry, language is presented to the student in short grammatical chapters. In GTM, language is presented in short grammatical chapters or lessons containing a few grammar points or rules. There will be grammar points or rules in the passage uh, that are relevant in the passage and uh, the passage will be given along with the grammar rules. Such things we have done in our schools also. However, we don't translate. And these grammar rules are illustrated with the help of examples. The grammar features are not disguised or hidden. They are very much there explicitly. The learner is expected to memorize and study a rule and its examples. There will be rote memorization. There will be beating. Huh? There will be imposition. <laughs> Words, phrases and sentences in the first language are translated into the target language. Words, phrases and sentences in the first language are translated into the target language and vice versa with the help of the bilingual vocabulary lists. As the teaching progresses, complex sentences are given for practice. Complex, more and more complex sentences are given as the teaching progresses, which will illustrate a number of rules simultaneously. This makes language learning a matter of problem solving or puzzle solving. This makes language learning a matter of problem solving or puzzle solving. Words, phrases and sentences are all translated from the first language to the target language and vice versa. I have told you that already. Now, what are the theoretical assumptions behind grammar translation method? The target language is considered as a system of rules. In grammar translation method, the target language is not seen as a language for communication. It is seen as a system of rules that is taught in relation with the L1 or first language. The target language is a system of grammatical rules and these are taught in relation with L1. The practice of language learning, languages, no, the practice of language learning is seen as an intellectual activity. The practice of language learning is seen as an intellectual activity involving rule learning, which required massive translation practices. Language learning means rule learning, intellectually learning rules through massive translation practices. The first language is maintained as a reference system always. Assessment. It is still relevant on many levels. The GTM is still relevant on many levels. The first language becomes a reference system. The first language becomes a reference system and it is important for language learners. The first language is referred and second language is learnt. Translation helps in this regard. 
Learning is an active problem for the GTM. Learning is an active problem. Sorry, uh, learning is an active problem solving situation for the GTM. You have to. Uh, I, I was thinking the focus is on active, I forgot. Learning is an active problem solving situation. I thought uh, that is also true. That is why I thought like that. The student has to be active. The student has to actively engage in the activities, right? The classroom through translation. The student is always memorizing and translating. It is not like a lecture method. So, but what is what I meant here is learning is an active problem solving situation. And uh, this made it an academic learning strategy. Limitations are also there obviously for GTM. Considering language as a mass of rules and limitations of practice techniques never emancipated the learner from the dominance of the first language. The first language always remained dominant because language was looked at as a mass of rules and the practice techniques were also limited. There was absolutely no emphasis on speaking or listening of the target language. It is a book oriented method which is not a very uh, advisable method according to contemporary perceptions, correct? There were many reform movements against GTM. There were many reform movements against GTM. The earliest critics of GTM were Marcel, Gowin, Prendergast. Actually, they are very important linguists if you are studying linguistics in detail. Um, modern foreign language teaching can be said to have begun in the 1800s with these people. Mod, what they called modern, <laughs> it was still the 19th century, but they called it modern foreign language teaching. These critics and reform movements down the ages, they all did not exist at the same time and speak at the same time. Down the ages, they argued for the replacement of traditional GTM or grammar translation method with oral language learning. Oral language was given importance, especially by Gouin, etc. In 1886, a big change came to GTM because of the establishment of International Phonetic Association. The International Phonetic Association was established and more and more importance was given to speaking and phonetics or pronunciation and uh, methods began to give importance to oral language teaching methods. At this time, very important are Henry Sweet, the English philologist and phonetician who wrote the practical study of languages. Wilhelm Wieter, the German phonetician and language educator who wrote the language teaching must start afresh. They're all part of the reform movements. Paul Passy, the French linguist who founded the IEPA International Phonetic Association. Now, the second important method that emerged from this, these reform movements is the direct method. As you may expect, the direct method addressed the major lacuna in grammar translation method. And what is that? Communication. In direct method, language is used as a tool for communication. Language began to be used not as a tool for translation, but for communication. And the grammar translation method was completely replaced by communicative methods after this. The direct method is also called natural method, direct and natural. Because the method is to immerse the learner in a target language in the same manner as you are immersed in a first language when you learn it. How do you learn a mother tongue or first language? You get immersed in it. Around you, everybody speaks it. And uh, similarly, in the direct method, the student is immersed in the target language. And direct method became the most common method in foreign language teaching. For example, for Indians, what is the best way to learn English? It is to get immersed in an English context. Go to a state, another state where you can only learn English. Sorry, where you can only speak English. Nobody understands your mother tongue. 
isn't it? So um, the direct method became very popular in foreign language teaching against the GTM. And uh, in the direct method, as part of immersion, all teaching is done in the target language. So what is given here? Direct method is characterized by the use of target language for instruction and communication in the language classroom. The direct method is characterized by the use of target language for instruction and communication, both. The learning is in, like our English medium schools, the textbooks and the class curriculum, everything is in English. The teacher is also communicating in English. Students should also communicate in English. It avoids the use of first language. And translation also is avoided. It avoids the use of first language and translation as a technique to teach second language. So the two main things in GTM are avoided. First lang use of first language is avoided. Translation is avoided. Major practitioners, Lambert Sower. He lived from 1826 to 1907. And he's the author of a very important book, Introduction to the Teaching of Living Languages Without Grammar or Dictionary. Have you heard of that? Take down. Introduction to the Teaching of Living Languages Without Grammar or Dictionary. Lambert Sower opened a school in Boston. Many of them were not only theorists but practitioners. And he developed the natural method. His direct method is called natural method. And uh, what does that mean? He turned into naturalistic principles of language learning. That is the meaning of natural method. Natural method means he turned to naturalistic principles of language learning. What do you mean by naturalistic principle? That means focus on a natural development of language learning. Language should be learned naturally from the situations. He proved that foreign language can be taught without translation. Foreign language can be taught without the use of a learner's native tongue. He proved that foreign language can be taught without translation, without the use of a learner's native tongue, if meaning is conveyed directly through demonstration and action. If meaning is conveyed directly through demonstration and action, then uh, meaning can be conveyed through direct, directly through demonstration action, then there is no need of L1 or translation. Clear? The meaning is conveyed through action, through demonstration, there is no need of L1. The focus is on exposure to the language or input what the student is exposed to, what the student is getting from the environment. That is the ex focus, not practice. So another aspect of GTM is also given up here. Rigorous practice is given up. Instead, there is intensive oral interaction, but no drilling. Oral interaction is there, but no drilling. Uh, oral interaction in the target language. Without drilling, without translation. Focus is on uh, exposure only. No drilling, no error correction. Focus on learning wide vocabulary base. Developing vocabulary is the focus. Another important figure in the direct method, which is a very um, broad method, umbrella term. Within that, many smaller methods developed. F. Franke. Even in his books, his name is given as F. Franke. Uh, he's a German scholar. What is the full form of F? I don't know. Like Sover before him, Franke advocated that language teaching should be undertaken with the target language. Do not use L1. The language teaching should be undertaken with the target language. In other words, a target language can be best taught only by using it. He focused on the psychological principles of direct association between forms and meaning in the target language. Listen, F. Franke, a um, German scholar, focused on the psychological principles of direct associations between forms and meanings in the target language. 
in the TL, there will be forms and meanings that are directly associated. What are the psychological principles behind it? He argued for a monolingual approach in teaching. Only target language should be used, monolingual. Actual use of target language in the classroom will facilitate only facilitate learning, he believed. Maximilian Berlitz lived from 1852 to 1921. American linguist, obviously. German-born American linguist. He is the founder of the Berlitz language schools. And he founded what is called Berlitz method. Like Sauber and Franke before him, See, Berlitz, before that, Franke, before that, Sauer. And then Franke, then Berlitz, right. Like the other two linguists before him, Sauer and Franke, all classroom communication in his method takes place in the target language. In the Berlitz method, the target language alone is used in the classroom. It's conversational teaching method. It is a conversational teaching method. Remember, unlike grammar translation method. That present practical vocabulary and grammar in the context of real life situations. The Berlitz method presents real life situations in the classroom where practical vocabulary and grammar is given to the student. Exposed, the student is exposed, immersed in practical grammar and vocabulary in real life situations. What does that mean? It means the grammar becomes an immersive environment where the students develop their oral skills. Isn't it? Now what is the history of the direct method? The history of the direct method. As a result of the language teaching reforms from 1850 to 1990, remember after GTM there were many reform movements. As a result of the language teaching reforms from 1850 to 1990 in Europe against the grammar translation method, the direct methods emerged. Many direct methods emerged. But these reforms were temporary. These reforms did not bring any long lasting method. Some of the titles of these reform methods some of the titles given to these new techniques of language teaching that emerged were reform method, natural method, phonetic method, etc. Unconventional teaching reformers like Berlitz and Gowin, remember he's important, unconventional teaching reformers were there like Berlitz and Gowin, they argued for better language learning in a new world of industry and international trade and travel. In the 19th century, there was increased international trade and travel industry because of the industrial revolution in England and other parts of Europe. Because of the industrial revolution, because of international trade and travel, these linguists argued for reform in language teaching. Better language learning techniques should be developed, they argued. They uh, advocated unconventional approaches and direct method which we are talking about is historically linked with the introduction of phonetics into language pedagogy. For the first time, phonetics becomes part of the language pedagogy, especially after the establishment of IPA. Spoken language and phonetics become important, insisting on the use of spoken language. The direct method and importance of phonetics was pioneered by the Cleveland plan across the region of Cleveland. Uh, Emily de Sauce, de Sauce, I think. Emily de Sauce, he was the director of foreign languages for Cleveland public schools in the US. And uh, uh, Emily de Sauce, this professor, introduced what is called the Cleveland plan. That uh, transformed the schools of Cleveland and uh, they pioneered the direct method. What do, what do you do there? The teacher speaks a word, students hear it, then they write it, and then they speak it. 
teacher speaks a word students hear it they write it and then speak it that is the methodology used features of direct method it is characterized by the shift from literary language to everyday spoken language the direct method is characterized by the shift from literary language to everyday spoken language remember in the grammar translation method literary language was important here in direct method everyday spoken language is important now after listening to this video sit and write a table uh, of all the differences between grammar translation method and direct method here mind training is not considered important training the mind is not considered important grammar is taught inductively whereas in grammar translation method deductively almost everything is different between these two methods <laughs> direct method is activity oriented both speech and listening are emphasized techniques are a text is presented by a teacher and that will be a narrative in the target language a text is presented by a target language text is presented by the teacher the students read aloud and teacher asks uh, questions based on it the students read aloud this text along with the teacher and the teacher asks questions based on it students are encouraged to understand grammatical principles on their own the students are asked to understand the grammatical principles on their own how inductively isn't it inductively deductively means you give rules they have to learn it and then learn the examples deductively means you give the example first and then they have to uh, learn uh, deduce the rules lot of practices uh, that are uh, part of grammar translation sorry uh, direct method are what are the practices related to um, no before i talk about the practices let me just uh, summarize uh, no i don't have to summarize you know it already the practices i will talk about what are the practices related to direct method one is transposition transposition was a method common in the 18th century it was the time when uh, teachers developed the language exercises from the discipline of rhetoric in the 18th century from rhetoric people developed teachers developed language exercises this technique called uh, transposition refers to the placing of words out of their natural order in other words in a se long sentence complicated sentence there will be some jumbling some jumbling of phrases and clauses the student has to reorganize the words simplify the writing and reduce it to natural order they have to improve the sentence by reordering the words that is transposition so this is an activity oriented method direct method is activity oriented uh, it usually uses in especially in the uh, among the initial in the initial level grammar uh, sorry direct method will use realia realia means objects from real life pictures etc realia means uh, objects from real life used as teaching aids Uh, in the later level they use transposition etc in the early level of grammar translation uh, sorry direct method they use realia pictures or visuals etc later methods employ more complicated techniques such as activities such as transposition as a result of these activities a lot of speech and listening will take place not actually writing but speech and listening will take place in the target language remember the mother tongue is forbidden and the speaking happens in real life situations uh, here the students are actively thinking and taking part in the activities in the target language and uh, the teacher and the student is like partners in the language learning process because they are communicating and the students are active it is like they are partners in the language learning process the next technique i have mentioned here is dictation i know that you will be aware of what is dictation 
the teacher speaks a text and the students have to transcribe it. Dictation means the students transcribe a spoken text. Then there is free composition. Free composition means what? The students are given a topic. They have to collect their thoughts, ideas, feelings, experiences, observations, etc. And write them down in an organized form, isn't it? That is composition. Since the direct method stresses on the use of spoken language, good pronunciation is ensured. Um, direct method stresses on the use of spoken language and good pronunciation is ensured. So pronunciation for the first time gets importance in direct method. What are the theoretical assumptions of the direct method? Teaching is based on phonetics and coherent grammar. Teaching is based on phonetics and coherent grammar, not grammar, rules, important. And uh, this is analogous to first language acquisition. The direct method is similar to first language acquisition. Immersion in situation similar to first language acquisition. Language is taught in relation to the immediate environment. That is classroom, home, garden, etc. Whereas in grammar translation methods, you use literature from the ancient times. Language is taught in relation to literature from the ancient times. But here, grammar is taught in relation to classroom, home, garden, etc. Such topics. Now, an assessment of this method. The method is the result of the involvement by language practitioners and linguists. Both language practitioners and linguists got involved and they transformed language learning environments. It was the first method which insisted on the importance of language use in classrooms in communicative contexts. For the first time, direct method insisted on language use in classrooms and encouraged the students to abandon L1 or first language as a frame of reference. L1 is not used. They demanded inventiveness on the part of the teachers. The teachers had to be creative, inventive. I, as I told you, the method involved using pictures, objects, or realia, interactive sessions, and the teacher had to improvise, they had to devise these uh, situations and techniques, they had to improvise in the classroom. Understood? And these methods, the various approaches within the direct method influenced the methods developed by Harold D. Palmer. Harold D. Palmer's method is oral method. Remember, all the direct methods are oral. And the English applied linguist Harold Palmer, Harold D. Palmer, used the oral method. He lived in, for some time in Japan, like our I.A. Richards and uh, William, M., uh, William M. Sim also, I think, uh, or F.R. Lewis. And uh, Japan, China, they worked in. And here, Harold E. Palmer reformed English teaching methods in Japan using his oral method. Right? And uh, I was telling you that direct method influenced methods of Harold E. Palmer in the 20th century. It influenced the audio-lingual and audio-visual methods in the 50s and 60s. Audio-lingual and audio-visual methods emerged in the 50s and 60s. And this direct method is the predecessor for today's immersion techniques. What do you mean by immersion techniques? Today we use that a lot. Immersion techniques means exposing students to instruction through the target language completely. And Communication, interaction completely in the target language. No use of any other language. Uh, even though immersion techniques is a general term relating to all the techniques of immersion, immersion technique is itself a method. So that is a little different from this general use of immersion techniques here. When I mentioned it here, I used it in a general sense. However, later in this presentation, we will come across a technique called immersion technique, where uh, in bilingual education, 
Uh, two languages are used for instruction in various topics like science, maths, social sciences, etc. In other words, in our English medium schools, how do we learn English through immersion technique? That means English is used to teach science, maths, social sciences, etc. So the language is used as a medium for instructing other subjects. That means language is taught by using it for instruction of other subjects. That is the technique called immersion technique used in Indian uh, English schools. What are the limitations of the direct method? Direct method is not uh, a perfect method. How to convey meaning without translation, without using L1 at all? How do you convey meaning? That is a challenge and a limitation. And how to prevent misunderstanding in the absence of first language use? I have studied German at Goethe syndrome and even though I pronounce all the German names wrong, <laughs> I just did a little bit of study and uh, there they used like an immersion technique. German, we don't know any German and we are sitting in the classroom but they will speak to us only in German. <laughs> Can you believe that? They will speak to us only in German. Uh, so it's also sometimes a limitation. How do you prevent misunderstanding? in the absence of the first language use. And the direct method using audiovisual techniques, etc., is suitable only for elementary learners, not for advanced learners. Though it is critiqued for total avoidance of the use of first language, it was considered as a valid approach to language teaching by major American educators like Hester and Diller. Hester and Diller. I'm not going into these people because it is not so important for us. Next, let us talk about the third method, that is audiovisual method. That is the third method we are talking about. Audiovisual method is a very effective method, but it is different from the use of multimedia education today. Today, we use multimedia in the technique called multimedia education, MBE. Audiovisual method was an early method that emerged in the 50s and 60s. Um, Using audiovisual techniques, they enhanced memory, uh, they, they taught the language, which enhanced the student's memory retention and motivation. So, audiovisual method is for teaching everyday language in the early stage of second or foreign language learning. In the audiovisual method, there are visual and audio techniques used. Visually represented scenario provides the chief means of involving the learner in meaningful utterances and context. The visually represented scenario is the chief means through which the learner gets involved in the utterances and context. The audiovisual method is based on a behaviorist approach. What is behaviorist approach? It is the idea that language is acquired by habit formation. Uh, language, the more you get exposed to language and it becomes your habit, then you acquire it. What is the history? Uh, audiovisual method emerged in the 1950s in France by a team directed by Gubira, Guberina and Rivenk at Credif. Credif is a center for research in France at that time. And this uh, method was a great alternative to teacher-centered methods and lecture-based methods. It was a great alternative to teacher-centered methods and lecture-based methods. And uh, it was devised for adult beginners. The audiovisual method was devised for adult beginners. People who are beginning to, uh, you know, learn a language. Later, it was adopted by institutions in America, Britain, and Canada. Later, it was adopted by institutions in America, Britain, Canada, etc. The credit methods were made popular through the teacher's courses in which the method was introduced. The teacher's courses uh, introduced these methods and it became popular because of that. Language learning 
in, in according to this method is visualized as falling into different stages. Language learning falls into three stages. The first stage is with the help of audiovisual methods. The leaner, learner becomes familiar with everyday language. In the first stage, with the help of audiovisual methods, the learner becomes familiar with everyday language. Clear. In the second stage, what happens? The capacity to consecutively read general topics and non-specialized fiction is advocated. The focus is on developing the capacity to read, consecutively read general topics. The focus is on developing the capacity to consecutively read general topics and also to read non-specialized fiction. Then the third stage, to be proficient in professional discourse. So first every day, then non-specialized and general, then professional. Note these key words. The techniques as devised by Crediff consisted of carefully thought out but rigid order of events. The carefully thought out but rigid order of events. Uh, the lesson begins with a film strip and tape presentation. The lesson begins with a film strip and tape presentation. That is the audiovisual method, audiovisual aid. It is played repeatedly over and over and over again. The film strip and tape presentation is played. The visual image and spoken utterance complement each other. The visual image is complemented by what is spoken. In a later stage, speakers are encouraged to speak without the use of tape recording. Speakers are encouraged to speak without the tape recording itself. Grammatical as well as phonological features are practiced. There is a practice of grammatical features and phonological features. Writing and reading are delayed but taught at a later stage. Writing and reading are delayed but taught at a later stage. Then, um, what are the theoretical assumptions? It is rooted in descriptive linguistics. Audiovisual method is rooted in descriptive linguistics. Stressing on the social nature and situational embeddedness of language. Behaviorism means situational embeddedness of language. The language has a social nature. It is embedded in situations. That is the uh, basic assumption of audiovisual method. The social nature of language and the situational embeddedness of language becomes the uh, foundation of language teaching in the audiovisual method. It is intended to simulate the social context in which language is used. It is intended to simulate the context, the social context in, in which language is used is simulated. And it, it, is, it employs the use of gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychology is important in um, ELT and also literary theory. It is the relationship between the part and the uh, whole that is evoked in Gestalt psychology. It was a uh, it was a uh, branch of psychology that was invented in the twentieth uh, century in Germany itself. It was in Germany that Gestalt psychology uh, emerged. And the word Gestalt in uh, German means pattern. The entire pattern or the whole is uh, emphasized. So that is related to audiovisual uh, technique, audiovisual method. The audiovisual method tries to place language learning into a simplified social context. This is the assessment of the method. It uh, tries to place language learning in a simplified social context. Remember, social embeddedness of language is highlighted. To teach language from the outset as a meaningful spoken communication. 
to teach language as a meaningful spoken communication. Language learning is made part of a social context. What are the limitations of the audiovisual method? It has difficulty in conveying meaning. It has difficulty in conveying meaning and the use of film strip and recording does not ward off chances of misinterpretation, uh, chances of misinterpretation. There are chances of misinterpretation. There are chances of mis misinterpretation even though you use film strip and recording. So there is difficulty in conveying meaning. Did you understand? That is a limitation of the audiovisual method. The rigid teaching sequences imposed by this method are based on an entirely unproved assumption about learning sequences. The order of learning or the sequence of learning, which is entirely unproved and not very scientific, that is the basis for the uh, rigid teaching sequences that are part of audiovisual method. That is another limitation. Now the next term that we have to talk about, the next method. This is not a very common method or a long living method, but it is very important. It is called Suggestopedia. Suggestopedia, also known as Desuggestopedia, is a technique that emerged in the 1970s. The term suggestopedia, suggestopedia combines two words, suggestion and pedagogy. Suggestion and pedagogy. The main idea being that accelerated learning can take place when accompanied by suggestion or desuggestion. Desuggestion of psychological barriers and suggestion of positive influences. When there are negative influences, they have to be desuggested. When there are positive influences, they have to be suggested. So, uh, I suppose you did not understand completely. It will be very clear very soon. You see, we are surrounded by suggestive influences always. Around us, the things that happen, sounds, smells, people, objects, you know, these are all suggestions that affect our minds and impact upon learning. Sometimes it can be music. Sometimes it can be something else in the environment, the setting. For example, sitting in a, you know what happened? Um, I went to England on a literary tour and I sat in a field in a little wooded field in Dorset and read Tess of the Durbervilles. Over two, three days, I sat under a tree in a wooded area beside a field where cattle were grazing and farmers could be seen. There I sat and read Tess of the Durbervilles. The experience of the novel how I understood the novel sitting there and reading was never, it was like never before. Because the suggestion of the environment, the smell of cow dung, the sight of cattle, the sound of cattle, the atmosphere, where Hardy also might have sat and read Tess, or I mean written Tess. So if you can uh, uh, simulate a conducive environment for learning, then that will enhance learning, that will accelerate learning. That is the meaning of suggestopedia. The suggestions that are around us, when we study these suggestive elements around us in life, we become aware of their influences. We can utilize suggestions better to help us in learning. That is the idea. It was developed in the 1970s by Georgi Lozanov, a Bulgarian doctor of medicine, psychiatry. Uh, he uh, also was a parapsychologist. He developed this theory based on the theory of joy and easiness. You are still wondering how to do it. 
I will explain. The teacher plays some relaxing music and reads a text that suits the music in a manner that suits the music. In a very dramatic manner, suiting the music, the teacher has to read the text. It's like drama. Against the background, the music will be playing. Another text will require another kind of music. So this atmosphere, the environment becomes emotionally comforting and conducive to the text. Sometimes uh, the, the, the chairs that the students use are also very comfortable. The decor, the lighting, everything is related to the mood of the text. And the teacher-student relationship is very patronizing and almost like parent-child relationship. It's a whole and drama that is created there. The suggestion of music helps to understand the text better, helps to not only comprehension but also memorization. Students are also made to memorize parts of the text in this environment. Understood? That is the methodology. D suggestion is the opposite of suggestion. Sometimes students will have psychological barriers such as fear or they will have different paces of learning which will be their limitation. So the psychological barriers and limitations are these suggested using teaching techniques. So that means suggestopedia or desuggestopedia focuses on the power of the student's feelings to influence theory. How the student's mind, not theory, sorry, learning. How the student's mind influence their learning. The power of the student's feelings to influence learning. So this is all, all this idea is based on suggestology. A psychological theory which says that human beings respond to subtle clues of which they are not consciously aware. Human beings respond to subtle clues uh, or suggestions of which they are not consciously aware. Now, Lozanov described suggestology as a science concerned with the systematic study of the non-rational and or non-conscious influences. Lozanov described suggestology as a science he made elaborate claims for the success of uh, suggestopedia. Not su uh, suggestopedia is elaborate claims. It was based on suggestology. But however, uh, other later critics have argued that that was exaggeration. Lozano argued that we do not use our mental capacities to the full. Lozano said that we never use our mental capacities completely because of many psychological barriers. It is the pedagogic application of suggestion that you see here. Suggestology uh, is employed for the pedagogic application of suggestion, helping the learner to overcome the mental barriers to learning. There are three main principles of suggestology. Joy. Create an environment of joy and psychological relaxation. That is the first principle. The second is gaining access to the reserve powers of the mind. Gaining access to the reserve powers of the mind. Third is harmonious collaboration of the conscious and the unconscious. You have the reserve powers of the mind. You have to tap it. And then the conscious and the unconscious will begin to collaborate. Clear? What are the objectives of Suggestopedia? To develop advanced conversational proficiency quickly. The aim of Suggestopedia is to develop advanced conversational proficiency quickly. To increase memory power. And to encourage students to make dialogues graded with lexis and grammar. Lexis means vocabulary. To encourage students to make dialogues graded with. Levels are there. Easy difficult, le graded with lexis and grammar. In the classroom, there are some equipment, you, equipments is wrong. What are the equipment and aids used in the classroom? You know what I do? My research assistants will develop 
uh, the, the, the PDF that you see here. But not in this form. I have changed it a lot. I add information. I edit it. I expand it. I reorganize it. And as a collaborative effort, we are making these videos. It's a very, very elaborate process. So that is why sometimes some uh, corrections remain. Now, in the classroom, we use equipment and aids, like posters, charts, and music. The whole setting ensures a relaxed atmosphere for the learner. The whole setting ensures a relaxed atmosphere for the learner. What is the method used in Suggestopedia? Interactive sessions are there in the classroom using games, role play, creative language, etc. Creative language work, language activities, etc. Remember, before etc., there should always be a comma. Okay? That is very essential. Before etc. Now, this technique that I am using to teach you, I have to talk about my technique also uh, in this context. This technique that I am using to teach you using elaborate PowerPoint presentations is developed from a lot of uh, educational methods, which is our topic today, methods of teaching. Uh, I have been devising this method and it is this method that I have used in the encyclopedia and that is why the encyclopedia is a bestseller. Because in today's world or in education, what you need is the content. The main content is what I'm giving you in the form of points. The way you elaborate the content is your subjective style. That style will, is what will give you marks in the exam. So that is, it is very important that you get this, these points. If I write out all this matter in written style, it will come to thousands of pages which you will never probably read or it will be tedious. The tedium of studying is what I have reduced here. And this is what I went to Oxford and talked about for four times. Four times I presented a paper at Oxford uh, about this method that I have been developing. So uh, use the most of this method. You have to memorize the content words that are given in these uh, concentrated matter that I'm giving you. This, these, this material that I'm giving you is highly concentrated. And uh, this material is so valuable because it contains points for an entire book which you should elaborate in your own style. Now let us come back to Suggestopedia. I was talking about suggestion. Suggestopedia. Hmm? The learner's role. What is the learner's role in Suggestopedia? Learners must try not to figure out, manipulate or study the material presented, but maintain a pseudo-passive state. Do not be active. Just relax in the classroom. Just give in to all the suggestions. Do not think too much, figure out, manipulate or study. <laughs> Very weird, eh? remain in a pseudo-passive state. Learners are expected to tolerate and encourage their own infantilization. <laughs> I told you parent-child relationship is the re relationship between teacher and student. Parent-child relationship. Infantilization. The teacher's role is to create situations in which the learner is most suggestible. The teacher has to create situations where the learner is most suggestible. The suggestions can go to the learners easily to encourage positive reception and retention by the learner. The learner can get positive reception and retention. Lozano lists several expected teacher behaviors. What are the expected teacher behaviors? They are show absolute confidence in the method. Show absolute confidence in the method. Display fastidious conduct in manner, dress, etc. It is very important how you dress, how you behave. 
how much confidence you show in the method then what are the pedagogic principles behind it learning takes place best in a relaxed and happy atmosphere you sit in your room and in a relaxed manner where all the positive suggestions are there you are listening to me now when you watch these slides and when you uh, listen to my soothing voice in the comfort of the positive suggestions of your room better learning takes place that kind of a situation is uh, emulated in the classroom also sufficient listening time must be given for the learner to absorb the new material sufficient learning time must be given to the learner to absorb the new material lecture method in the classroom is very ineffective because the learner will not pay attention to everything that happens in the classroom the lecture method is the obsolete method that all these 20th century approaches have given up sufficient learning time you get using uh, many of the modern methods especially today in the post corona situation i'm so excited because everybody can learn at their pace everybody can pause the videos and listen to it repeatedly sit wherever they want eat whatever they want there will be absolutely brilliant input from the part of the students if only they listen to these videos because you get the absolutely positive environment sufficient learning time you can do it at your pace i think after corona i am never going to do classroom teaching again ever because this absolutely positive effective method of teaching has opened out to us this world of online teaching this world of opportunities that online teaching uh, presents to us the online teaching methods we are still not familiar with students are not uh, ready to accept online videos teachers do not know what to do with it it is only a matter of transition you know when i talk about teaching methods i cannot avoid talking about online teaching methods because that is what we are having these days we will have in future also it is the death of the lecture method in the classroom and uh, uh, online teaching methods are still very foreign to us we have to overcome the problems during this transition period and realize how wonderful in what wonderful ways we can use online teaching methods teachers have to be equipped for it i am very proud that i already am because i have been doing this even before corona came and uh, i throughout my classroom teaching also i have been developing methods of capturing your attention maintaining your concentration through the uh, way you use your voice through the way you use audio visual techniques isn't it so it is very challenging for the teacher to whenever a new method comes to adapt to that method and use it to the most uh, power in the most effective manner going on in suggestopedia there is role play which reduces threats where barriers to learning can be overcome many times adult learners will be um, feeling threatened by uh, the classroom situations they will not want to take risks but role play reduces the risk and threat the functional aspects of the language are emphasized in suggestopedia it has limitations traumatic themes and distasteful lexical material are avoided in order to maintain concert teaching concert classroom it is called in suggestopedia it is called concert teaching concert reading why because music is played in the background to maintain concert pseudo passiveness that means like in a concert you are passive in a pseudo manner to maintain that uh, you cannot actually teach traumatic themes and distasteful words only positive joyful beautiful things you can teach using suggestopedia that is a limitation it appears effective only with other successful techniques in language teaching alone suggestopedia cannot be a, 
technique. It has to be clubbed with other techniques. Did you understand?